Eight races every year. Every year. And that's not including uh, California Untamed. And that is not including California Untamed. Yeah. So let's talk about this. Yes. This is this is a big deal. So you just completed 330 miles from Arcata to Mount Shasta in six, yep. six days. Six days. Um, if you haven't seen the documentary, go. It's on YouTube. Just search California Untamed. It'll be the first thing that pops up. Yep. So so walk me through your process. How how did you conceptualize this whole thing uh, yep. and then map it out and then actually complete it? Yeah, so for me that was when I had been speaking with Nigel Skeet. I know Nigel. And so we got together and kind of outside of Shasta Trail runs, you know, he came to me with the concept of California Adventure District. Right. And so, you know, for that taking Mendocino or Lake Tahoe to Mendocino to the Oregon border. How can we really thrive in an adventure tourism mainly dynamic? Right. So, so not to interrupt, but yep. just explain. California Adventure District is in its infancy. It is. Uh, so, just explain sort of the concept behind it, the big idea behind it. Yep. Yep. So for that, it's really then taking yeah. So drawing a line from Lake Tahoe straight across to Mendocino up to the Oregon border, and we're classifying that as the California Adventure District. So from a brand standpoint, it'll be there. We're working with legislature to have it formally branded kind of through a Visit California standpoint, California Venture District. And for that, really coming out the gates with kind of two things. So for the, you know, smaller businesses that exist today in each county, kind of within that region, hoping to elevate them on a global scale to really drive them more traffic and more customers and more people coming out to elevate their business. And then also for us now taking a look at, okay, there's a lot more, I think, in the adventure tourism space that we can be doing. So let's start creating some of these adventures and routes and events ourselves, hitting every outdoor adventure bucket. And then from that started with ultra running as our kind of go-to market. Let's put with this- With your familiarity. With my familiarity yeah. of it, let's put this place on the map, starting with one killer event. And so for me, that's where, I mean, surprisingly, it was about only three days it took me. So we're like, okay, location-wise, what should we do? Being able to do something from the coast in the sand to end up in the mountains is a pretty cool, iconic spot. Showcases every bit, like every kind of Northern California that you can see. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So I was like, okay, what's a way that I can pull in multiple counties, multiple districts, and again, multiple kind of just demographics from an outdoor adventure standpoint? And then it was pretty fluid, this route then from Arcata to Mount Shasta, you know, using county roads to get out of it, but then dipping into logging roads, forest roads, single track trail when I could. Um, you know, we're limited by just the wilderness areas. You can't get permits on it. Right. But, yeah, it flowed pretty together, pretty well together making that route and came out to 330 miles, which would then make it the longest U.S. continental route in Amer point to point. Point to point, yeah. In America. And that's where then my wife was like, okay, again, kind of authenticity, proof of concept. Aside from just now putting on this event and, you know, scouting it here and there, go run the thing. Um, so I took it on in June. So what, what, what surprised you most about it that, that maybe you hadn't foreseen? Yeah, so I knew... Again, I had scouted to an extent as much as I could, just in my, I, in like my Jeep. Like physically or uh, like, like on your so computer? So on my computer and then driving the, a lot of the forest roads, I didn't really run any of it. And for me, you know, I'd done some 100-mile races, so I knew going into it physically this was going to be the biggest feat I'd ever done. So A, can I even do it? Um, and then B, is how the route looks that it should be, a lot of it more just online and satellite images, how's that going to play out? And I think that's the piece that surprised, didn't necessarily surprise me because I was expecting it, but then also surprised me on just how real some of those situations got when the trails either didn't exist that I thought they would, or it was so overgrown Yeah, that it made getting through it very difficult when you're already 200 miles in. Yeah, you see that in the documentary where you're just <laughs> like crawling through like plants. Yeah. Um, during like a 60 mile day it's, yeah. it's pretty incredible yeah that was hands down the worst emotional mental physical thing that I've, was day i have ever done that day was three? day three day three yeah um yeah and you also 
you had a, not health issues, but your foot was banged up pretty badly. Yeah. Yeah. So again, I, you know, I put in training, but also I have a family. So to not be an absent father, right. you know, it's a fine line on how much <laughs> training you can squeeze in. So I knew going into it, you know, it's probably going to give myself a C, C plus physically for what I could do, but I knew mentally, you know, I can, I can suffer Power a lot, through, yeah. <laughs> so I'll, I'll get it done. Um, but yeah, my, uh, pretty much end of day one, early day two, the, uh, top of my, the tendon just below your shin flared up. So I had some nice can't go. I mean, my toes up into like high shin was pretty swollen wow. on as of the second day. It's pretty telling. I believe it's in the beginning of the the film yeah. when you're crawling out of your tent and you yeah. can barely you can barely stand up and then it's like, oh yeah, he's gonna run like seventy miles today. Yeah. I mean for me that was the definitely the hardest part is every morning. So I'd roll in I mean, I assumed I was gonna get into each day, you know, I had kind of set stage days by dinner time. That was not the case. I rolled in at like midnight to 1 a.m. every day and then started at 5 a.m. the next oh, day. Oh, man. So it really wasn't much sleep. But, yeah, I pretty much started every morning not being able to stand and walk. And I was like, well, crap, man. How the heck am I going to do another 70-mile day today? And it just figured it out. What, what, <laughs> what's your, like, diet like? I, I mean, are you just, do you just have, like, cliff bars yeah. hanging out of your pockets? So I typically, you know, I eat pretty clean and healthy for that. Really, Pringles, PBJs. Mm. Um, yeah, cliff bars, tailwind. <laughs> That's so f in the film, you actually go to like one of those grab and go things <laughs> in, a, in like a Chevron station. I'm like, really? This is what he's eating? And that burrito is heavy. It's so good. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, insurers actually are my kind of secret sauce for my oh. go to. So you're not having to drink that much calorie because, you know, your stomach gets to a point where it doesn't really want to take in much. But you drink an insurer, it's got all the vitamins, minerals, and, you know, it's 280 calories in, like, two sips of, of liquid. I swear, those things are like gold. Interesting. So I suck down a lot of insurers. Wow. So, okay, so the, it happens, uh, the actual event. Yes. The same run, which I assume, it, like, you're going to go through and, like, build a trail, right? Yep, so luckily, so I've rerouted, so some of the spots kind of coming through Hoopa or where just the trail genuinely didn't exist. Deep, deep wilderness. I, I rerouted two sections, but then my day of hell, that six mile going from Orleans Lookout down to Nordenheimer Camp, uh -huh. um, so around my, like, 150 on the course, I now have been able to partner with Reading Trail Alliance. So Nate oh, and yeah. his crew are going to come out and we're going to take some chainsaws and create pretty much rebirth the trail that technically exists today. The, wow. <laughs> I, so this is such like a niche event. There's not many people on the planet that can do this run. Yeah. So how many people are actually going to compete? Yeah. So, I mean, with only being... Probably about 45 days in since we opened registration. We have kind of mid 50s right now of solos coming out for it. And solo meaning they're they're going they're, they're committed the to 330 miles yeah. um, to take it on. So yeah, we have about 55 right now. And again, from a global scale. So for me, it's been cool. My whole hope was that this would have that glo a pretty quick global lens to it. Mm -hmm. And some of the first people to sign up were folks in Australia, Europe, Ireland. Croatia, Canada. So, you know, a lot of these people who didn't really know Arcade and Mount Shasta necessarily existed or may not have ever thought of coming here. Uh, we have now a decent amount of those folks. And obviously a lot of stateside people coming too. But yeah, we got about 55 people in the solo. And then a couple of relay teams signed up as we have a three-person, six-person, and 12-person relay team. So again, I want to add a dynamic where you don't necessarily need to be the full crazy to commit to the 330, right. but let's also get people and have the whole team dynamic out there. So baked in a few of those relay divisions. So it, like you had your film crew with you. Do, yep. do these people have crews like the Tour de France or something? Yeah, like so I set it up. So for the 330 miles, there's going to be 29 aid stations. Okay. So about every seven to, I think, 18 miles is the longest stint without aid. There'll be an aid station. Seven of those will be water drops. So it'll just be, you know, kind of a table and self-support out there. First aid. First or, aid. Yeah. And then 22 of those will be your full food set up where we'll have chefs cooking, you know, a, a dinner, lunch, and breakfast meal each day. The lookout towers. So you hit six beautiful lookout towers out there. I'm turning those into sleeping stations so, you know, runners can get a couple hours of sleep if they want to sit down. 
Instead of like camping. Instead of camping, we'll have our own tent and cots and sleeping pads oh, wow. set up. So yeah, you come in, you can, you know, order a burger, eat some food, go lay down for a couple hours and then continue oh, on your incredible. way. That's incredible. That's cool. Yeah. So the Lookout Towers and Lake Siskiyou will be sleeping spots for it. Um, and then, yeah, getting yourself to Bunny Flat. And so you're probably going to have like a big party at Buddy Flat yeah. for everyone. So then there'll be a huge party at Buddy Flat. And and do you like track these runners as they're going for yeah. safety? And Yep. So we'll have spot trackers. So every runner will have a GPS tracker on them. So to the minute, you know, myself and my medical director will be able to, you know, know exactly where everyone is. So if someone goes off course, we can send out folks to go tell them to turn around and direct them back on track. Gotcha. If there's any medical issues, we'll know exactly where they are. Um, so yeah, it'll have the whole logistics is, is dialed in. What was the most beautiful place you saw on this 330 mile trek? Yeah. Is that a hard, mm, that's a hard, hard question. One to answer? I would say my first genuine awe moment and also dear God moment was probably Orleans lookout tower. So you're about mile 150, and that was the first spot that you could see Mount Shasta and then turn around and you could see some spots of the coast and the ocean. So it was a cool on, oh man, like I'm going there. But then quickly your mind was like, oh man, I'm going there. It's like a beacon. <laughs> it was a beacon. So yeah. it, was, it was a cool spot to see where you're going, but then also all the forest and miles to get there. And then Boulevard Lookout had kind of that same feeling where it you gave- You guys had the drone look in the yeah. video. That was awesome. So for that, I th I'd say Boulevard was the most epic visual of you had really cool trails to get to it and then mount shasta was just staring at you and at that you're 200 and some miles in so you're you know you're starting to taste mount shasta as you're getting closer but it's just a surreal view and there's quite a bit of wildlife right there's quite a bit of wildlife so so tell me about your encounter <laughs> yeah i mean yeah so i saw 15 bears or plus so on my on my run for it or when i ran it so, two to three a day. Two to three a day. Wow. And they were all pretty close, you know, between me and 20 yards out. So, yeah, my most, again, they're all black bears for the most part. They're pretty skittish, so I was never that afraid to see one. You know, I didn't bring bear spray, which I probably should, but yeah. I didn't. <laughs> um, yeah, coming in to buy uh, Scott Mountain, I then came across a bear. And typically, you yell, throw a rock, they run away. This was one I saw. I yelled, it sat down. I yelled again, it laid down and was just staring at me. So I had a moment of, oh man, I'm by myself. I'm super tired. Am I going to fight a bear right now? Um, <laughs> but yeah, luckily I was able to get that one out of the way. But it's cool. It, you quickly realize you're you're deep in the back country. It's, um, a, it's an away game. It's an away sure. game. Yeah, yeah, you're on their home turf. Yeah. It's nothing to mess with. Um, yeah. 